I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... Twilight of the Superheroes. What is the Twilight of the Superheroes? Well, after his iconic run on Swamp Thing and critical acclaim of Watchmen, Alan Moore pitched a book to DC Comics that would be the end of the DC Universe, titled Twilight of the Gods. However, after having a falling out with DC over the treatment of his books, royalties, and ownership issues, the book never materialized, and now it's one of the most famous unmade comics masterpieces ever. A bearded wizard enters the chat. Alan Moore is the closest thing mainstream comics has to an auteur writer. He helped usher in a bold new era of storytelling. He is also the direct cause of many of comics' shortcomings and problematic tropes. However, today, we're going to explain The Twilight of the Superheroes, Alan Moore's unfinished epic crossover comic that would have served as the definitive ending to the DC Universe. We're going to break down the story, evaluate the characters involved, and examine why it fell apart. Today, it's popular to bash Alan Moore for his strict adherence to a gritty realism and deconstructionist approach. However, in the 1970s and 80s, his approach to comics was jaw-dropping and inventive. Many of the people who don't enjoy this modality of storytelling are in many ways heaping blame on Moore for the ripple effects that his works have had, as opposed to evaluating the work for its own merit. But, you know, that's comics. From his iconic runs on things like Miracle Man and Swamp Thing to Watchmen, his boundary-pushing book with Dave Gibbons, Moore casts a long shadow over the mainstream comic sphere. But more importantly, when he was a young man, he rocked a mean, blunt-cut bangs hairdo. What do you think of this photo, Spandrew Spice? Yeah, dear God. Alan Moore looks like he used his omniscient third eye to peer into the future and listen to King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. <laughs> You know what he looks like to me in this photo? We're looking at a photo of uh, 18 or 19 year old um, Alan Moore. And what he looks like here to me is, you know, those are they called Lopsa Opsos? You know, those dogs that have like floppy big ears and are kind of like weird and long faced. Is that a Lopsa Opso? I don't I don't know. He looks like a weird dog is what I'm trying to say. There's a few there's a few different dogs that you're that like what you're describing. So I'm not sure which one it is. But yeah, I mean. Yeah, they look like those they look like those big, flat, shaggy, furred, floppy ears that a dog can have. Yeah, it's amazing. It's him in like a photo booth in the, you know, like probably late 60s or early 70s. And it's yeah, it's 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 interesting to see like the lower half of his facial structure, because I mean, it's recognizably him. But also, I don't think I've ever seen him without a beard. I just don't think I've looked at early early photos of him. There aren't many like he I don't think he's not had a beard in 40 years. Yeah. So it's like it's interesting because like half of his face looks like him and then half of his face is like, oh, that's what his face looks like. Yeah, it's uh, it's strange to gaze upon the face of Alan Moore. Yeah, he 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 looks like a an Aleister Crowley aficionado. Yes. Alan Moore also he looks he looks like the protagonist in like some movie from the 1970s about some like Holden Caulfield esque figure that would serve to be this like cult classic that like teenagers from the early 2000s would have gotten obsessed with. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, it's funny, too, because Alan Moore, as an adult, has such an iconic visual look. You know, his giant mop of hair and this giant long wizard beard and these, you know, rings that are like dragon's eyes and shit. Like, um, it's 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 funny to see somebody before they've kind of manifested their brand in air quotes, you know, where they've figured out like, oh, this is what an Alan Moore tweed coat looks like. Like he's just like wearing like normal clothes. Yeah. Yeah. This was this was before he had that suit up montage where he pieced together his his iconic look like every doctor does during the first episode after the regeneration. But he's like, oh, this is going to be my new thing is chains. <laughs> oh, dragon rings. 
dragon rings that I just found on this dresser of this house that I broke into. Yeah, uh, you know, I feel like most people listening to this probably know, but I'm just going to say this briefly. Um, Alan Moore is probably the writer who's single most responsible for pushing the comics medium in an adult direction in the mainstream superhero sphere. Uh, he he took he brought a rubric to superhero storytelling and genre storytelling that was like, what if it existed in the real world? You know, a deconstructionist, gritty, formalist approach. Uh, he's very interested in nine panel grids. He's very interested in um, approaching characters with an eye towards realism and because of that uh there is some aspects to his work that i think in the modern light are cast in a specific uh in a specific kind of domain where i think he has a in certain circles he has a reputation for including uh sexual assault in ways that um i was just gonna say he's very interested in having uh hide of jekyll and hyde rape an invisible man to death that's that's one of the things that people bring up a lot is his you know his penchant to include sexual assault uh and i think that is something that is in his work that is worthy of assessment and dialogue about yeah, especially especially like in, you know, like in in Watchmen, for instance, where like, I mean, that's that's one example where I mean, it's still pretty shocking and gruesome, but it's like a horrific beast, like getting revenge on a, a an also terrible person. Like there's maybe some play in there, but specifically in Watchmen, where like the sexual assault of women is just used as a continual plot point that's like used to pivot the story forward like multiple times. You know, it's almost kind of like its own version of fridging where it's like rape as revenge becomes a plot contrivance. Yeah. Um, I think there's also, you know, his works have become so popular and, and tower so far above everything else that there's like an entire body of work that he's made that most people aren't aware of that have zero rape in it. So there's also not necessarily like a but actually, but there's just there's just more context to to the story than most people want to have you know like there's no there's no rape in halo jones you know what i mean there's no rape in any of his 2008 well there's a little bit but there's ve- there's a significant less amount in his you know 2000 ad works um a little dabble do yeah yeah exactly yeah um but you know like there's no rape in arguably the greatest superman story ever told for the man who has everything um you know but uh there's there's a I think there is a conversation to have around his works for sure. Um and and maybe this comes up later at some point or maybe I don't know, but because of that and because of a few other things and because sometimes or not sometimes, fucking all the time, almost every almost in every instance, um c- certain satire is sort of mistaken by huge swaths of people as genuine you know, the generation of people who idolize Gordon Gecko or the fact that like there's this huge group of the boys fans who don't realize that it's like specifically a satire of fascism and that uh, the main character, the main the Homelander guy, he's not like a hero. He's like supposed to be like a a, a parody of like Donald Trump type people. Um, I think that because of the particular stories that Alan Moore wrote or not all of them, but some of them Watchmen and like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and stuff. Yeah. Killing joke the the ways that he depicted characters, the ways that he didn't like babysit you through and like tell you like this is the good one and this is the bad one and these things are good and these things are bad. Um, and because of the inclusion of certain things like the sexual assault stuff, the, he's like one of those writers or one of those creators who attracts a fan base of people that just took the opposite message from what the story was. And so there's this ingrown fan base of like incel shitty like alt-right people that are like really into alan moore stuff because it's just like well specifically rorschach right like rorschach in in watchmen is like a far-right psychopath and the book is saying he's wrong but because he's one of the main characters and you're reading his journals if you are sympathetic to that perspective 
it feels like representation as opposed to indictment. Yeah, you can read the thing totally differently. But I think there's also just there's something to be said, too, about because he was one of the first people to truly push a medium that had been censored into a little kid's, you know, pastime into a more adult area simultaneously while using those children's characters. Um, You know, it had an outsized effect, too, of like every writer that followed Alan Moore for like a decade and a half was just trying to do the Alan Moore thing but with none of the formalist inventiveness or eye to detail or um, insightful, you know, view into the human condition. It was just like, oh, we'll just make it dark and gritty and people will get raped, uh, which is like not cool. You know, like I'm not saying it's. Yeah, which spot. Yeah, it spawns pun intended. It, it spawns the the 90, the 80s and 90s era of just like badass. Yeah, the grim dark. Yeah leather and fucking and like spooky shit type comics where it just has none of that like sophistication it's just like it's it's like the 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 aesthetical trappings of what the what he popularized yeah 100 100 um so that's a little bit of background on alan moore uh if you haven't read any of his books uh i don't even know where i would suggest somebody start i guess if you're familiar with comics but you haven't read Stuff like Watchmen or V for Vendetta or Swamp Thing. Those are probably the big three. Uh, if you are familiar with comics, uh, but haven't read Miracle Man slash Marvel Man, I would say read that stuff. But maybe don't read the Marvel reprints that have just recently come out. They're really poorly colored and they kind of ruin the whole book for me personally. Uh, so, you know, you can find those on pirate sites and or back issue bins. Um, not that I'm advocating piracy necessarily, but... You know, Alan Moore doesn't want you to buy the Marvel reprints either. He took his name off it. So keep that in mind, I guess. In 1987, just a year after the smash success of Watchmen, Moore submitted a 33-page proposal to DC Comics for a universe-wide crossover event. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Wait, didn't Alan Moore have a massive falling out with DC Comics over the rights to Watchmen and other editorial issues? Yes, he did. We'll get to that. But as of 1987, Moore was on good terms with DC Comics. He had been discussing what his next project would be with Paul Levitz, the future president of DC Comics. Moore spends the initial three pages of this document discussing the commercial viability of his pitch and retreading some of the finer minutiae that he and Levitz had been going over in their correspondences. Moore's proposal was for a book called Twilight of the Superheroes. It would be a companion piece to something like Dark Knight Returns. It was to serve as an ending for the entire universe. Moore posits the hypothesis that all myths need to create an ending in order to ascend into legend, and accordingly lays out a plan for how to construct the end of the DC universe without hampering stories or boxing in creators. The brief synopsis of the story is that Twilight of the Superheroes takes place roughly 30 years out from mainstream continuity in 1987. There are two narratives that make up the story, a framing device and a central story. The framing device follows the time traveler Rip Hunter being sent back from the year 2000 by John Constantine to 1987 to find, you guessed it, John Constantine, in order to stop a horrible future where humanity lives under the boot of a ruling class of superhumans. The twilight of the superhero's future sees a feudal system being enacted, with the major clans of superheroes splitting up into eight houses. The House of Steel, which features Superman and Wonder Woman having married and ruling over much of the eastern seaboard, Diana has changed her name to Superwoman. They have an unruly son and a kind-hearted daughter. The House of Thunder, which includes Captain Marvel and his Marvel family. Marvel is distinctly different at this time. Gone is the smiling, apple-cheeked, big red cheese. Marvel's now married to Mary Marvel, his sister. He's dour and withdrawn. He's solemn and stern and commanding. The House of Titans is composed of the still remaining Teen Titans characters. A brooding Nightwing leads the team. He's broken up inside over the death of Starfire. Cyborg is more machine than man now, losing almost all of his humanity. 
Same thing with Beast Boy, who now spends the majority of his days in a hybrid animal form, choosing to go by the new codename Chimera. The House of Mystery, which is made up of the mystic characters like Dr. Fate, Jason Blood, Zatanna, and Spectre, which doesn't factor in the story as much as you might think. The House of Secrets, built out of DCU's greatest villains, runs the entirety of Nevada. Joker, Luther, Dr. Savannah, Captain Cold, and Gorilla Grodd actually look out for the inhabitants of their domain now. They don't want to incur the wrath of the larger houses. The House of Justice is constructed on the remains of the old cavern headquarters. The team is composed by the younger characters who've now grown into new mantles. Kid Flash, who's now the Flash, Wonder Girl, who's now Wonder Woman, as well as a new Dr. Light and Captain Comet. The House of Tomorrow is comprised by, you know, Time Travelers, Space Ranger, Two or Three, Rip Hunters, Jonah Hex, and Barry Allen's version of the Flash. And finally, the House of Lanterns, which is actually more than just a bunch of Green Lanterns. It's any alien living on Earth, Thanagarians, Lanterns, Ranians, whoever. You name it, and they're in the House of Lanterns. They've been pushed off Earth by the House of Steel, and they now live on the moons of Mars. You know, it's kind of funny because on on paper, this is kind of like the thing that you don't like, right? Like this thing where it's like the hyper realism grittying of the characters that they do in movies a lot where it's like, all right, it's Batman. But like instead of Catwoman just being like a cat burglar that wears a cat suit, she's got a tactical visor that flips up and kind of looks like ears and like. Bane is Bane because he has like a facial wound that causes him pain and the mask like keeps like it's technically it's kind of the thing that you always hate. I mean, it is sort of, but it's also so crazy and like weird and outlandish that it's also not. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, because I don't. Yeah, I don't. I to, to be clear, I don't hate this. I This sounds cool to me. I kind of hate that less than you do, but I still don't care for it as much. But yeah, on paper, it's like this is the thing where it's like, oh, let's just make let's take this character and just make it the most like like droll, like brooding. What's the least charitable version of this? The internal logic of this possible. Let's take this thing and just like interpret it through this like really hyper realistic lens where it just becomes like what like. What if Superman actually was a sociopath and then it's a horror movie where he's killing people or whatever. But yeah, so bringing it all together and giving it this sort of absurdist like concept that it's just a bunch of like kingdoms, like warring kingdoms and a future Earth somehow like makes it work more. Well, and the fact, too, that like looking at this in context that everything you're talking about, about like the, the hyper grittying of everything is like a trope that happens two decades from this point. So doing a thing where Captain Marvel is like married to his sister and like gritty and dour would have been fucking crazy in 1987. It would have been nuts. You know, there's like, there's like a, a legion of like 24 year old dudes who, if they ever heard about this, because they've never heard of this, they definitely don't know anything about actual comics. But if they ever heard about this, they would start the Zack Snyder Twilight of the Superheroes like campaign. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the, the new Snyder the Snyder sequel. Yeah, totally. And they would and they would gaslight Warner Brothers into green lighting it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yes. And somehow Warner Brothers would like give him three hundred million dollars to make it. And then like he would make it and it would just go on to HBO Max. And then the whole company would just like go under uh, completely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um. So uh, I guess before, you know, I'm, uh, we're going to read this. uh We're going to read this pitch doc in a minute, but before we dive into the nitty gritty details and hear the words from Mr. Moore himself, what do you, what do you think about the, uh, the basic setup, the fact that it's going to be like a rip hunter coming back in time, almost Terminator style and interacting with contemporary John Connor and John Connor, or, uh, John Constantine and John Constantine's going to have to kind of go around and like try and gather troops and factions of these kingdoms in order to stop this apocalypse where the superheroes uh specifically the house of 
Steel and the House of Thunder combine and just rule everybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I'd read the shit out of this 100 percent. The thing I the thing that's so funny to me about it is like 90 percent of it feels timeless. And like you could basically just do this story now. And then a couple key elements that we'll get into later are like very 1987 continuity. You know, like one, the fact that Constantine features so heavily in it, um, you know, because this is he was on a rising wave of popularity because he was from that Swamp Thing run that Alan Moore wrote. And so people were like, whoa, John Constantine. Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah. And also the fact that at the climax, at the climax of the story, Superman is defeated by um, a, a, the, a, a flock of seagulls concert. <laughs> The, mu- the, mu- the music is his is his like his, is his like audio kryptonite and it just and it's they're like it, like the scientists are like we can we can infuse kryptonite into this synthesizer and then hearing uh hearing fucking um a- and I ran will will bring Superman to his knees. Lex Luthor just grabs the mic, puts on a flock of seagulls wig and he's like and I ran I ran so far away. And Superman's like, no, no. That part, that part is a little, is a little, puts a stamp in the time for sure. I'm into it though. I'm, I'm like, I like it. I'm into it. Act two. And with that, let's read the document. I got you a present. It's an entire archive.org of the document for you to read. Dear God. It's only 30 pages. Should I read it like this? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Twilight of the Superheroes, The Interminable Ramble, an unpublished series proposal for DC Comics by Alan Moore. Okay, I'm sure this is going to be an interminable ramble as these things usually are, but I first want to set down my thoughts on the whole idea of mass crossovers. Partly in response to Paul's letter on the subject and partly just to clarify my thinking for myself. Hopefully somewhere along the line, you might catch a glimpse of some of the logic behind the story outline that follows and will thus be able to make a little more sense of my reasons for doing that way, which would sound better with a British accent. It just sounds like a grammatic, it sounds like a typo without it. Firstly, as I see the commercial side, taking into account what Paul was kind enough to pass on to me, the perfect mass crossover would be something like the following. It would have a sensible and logical reason for crossing over with other titles so that the readers who were prompted to try a new title as a result of the crossover or vice versa didn't feel cheated by some tenuous linkage of storylines that was at best spurious and at worst non-existent. It would provide a strong and resonant springboard from which to launch a number of new series or with which to revitalize old ones, again in a manner that was not obviously crassly exploitative so as to insult the reader's intelligence with an eye to the merchandising that Marvel managed to spin out of Secret Wars. I think it's safe to assume that if it were possible to credibly spin role-playing games, toys, quote, waiting for Twilight posters and t-shirts and badges and all the rest of that stuff from the title, then that would be a good idea too. Ideally, it might even be possible, while appealing to the diehard superhero junkie, to produce a central story idea simple, powerful, and resonant enough to bear translation to other media. I mean, I know that I'm probably still intoxicated by the Watchmen deal, but it never hurts to allow for these things as a possibility, does it? Okay, so assuming that the above is an accurate summary of what ideally DC would like to see happen with the title commercially, then I'll go on to tackle the other pertinent areas of concern with an eye to that and then hopefully tie the whole lot together at the end before moving on to the actual plot outline. If I don't manage that and just forget and wander off at a tangent or something that I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to bear with me. As long as I don't start free associating about my childhood, then we should be okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really funny. I feel I feel like I feel like Alan Moore, I mean, he's he is funny, but then also I think he's funnier than he even seems like he is when you just read his writing because his like delivery is a little spooky. Like he's he's got a vibe to him, and so he almost comes off like, oh, I'm like a, I'm like a, a sur- an acerbic wit or whatever. But you read his writing, it's like, no, he's just like a really funny guy. It's it's hidden by his cockney creepy. Um, the first of these other pertinent areas relates to the effect of the storyline in question upon the DC universe itself. And in response to this, I figure that perhaps I ought to outline briefly my thoughts upon crossovers of this magnitude in general. For one thing, they require some very hard thinking about in advance if they are not going to generate more problems than they solve. And in thinking about something which will affect every book that the company publishes, 
if only in subtle ways, then one obviously has to be very careful. I should say that as yet, although I saw the outlines, I haven't read any of the Legends series or its crossovers, mainly by reason of not having to go out to a comic shop recently. The premise, if I understand it correctly, looked very good. It seemed to be attempting to give a sort of resonant mythic context to the DC pantheon while at the same time establishing a more vigorous social context for the assembled characters in terms of its storyline. Thus, drawing the whole DC universe together into an interesting whole, which is exactly what needs doing the wake of the crisis. The more we can reinforce the idea of the DC universe as a magical and fascinating concept in itself, assuming that those are our aims, then the more successful we'll be in keeping readers hooked upon that universe and on the books that chronicle its various phenomena. Of course, this approach isn't without its problems. If you don't do it right, if your assembled multitude of characters looks merely banal, which I personally believe happened with Secret Wars, although that may be personal prejudice on my part, then your entire continuity is cheapened in the long term along with its credibility, whatever the short term benefits in terms of sales might be. When this happens, your only recourse is to greater acts of debasement in order to attract reader attention, more deaths to appease the arena crowd element in the fan marketplace, eventually degenerating into a geek show. This is so funny to me because he's basically describing spot on exactly what the entire industry became all throughout the 90s and 2000s. Like, just an arms race of perpetual crossovers, killings, extreme status quo shifts that weren't going to last more than six months in order to try it. The only thing he's not talking about here is variants. That's the only thing he isn't, like, spot on about. Because he's, you know, the variant covers weren't really a thing as much in, in the 80s. You should have fucking listened to me. It's so funny. It's so it's so dark, really. At a certain point, I feel like they're just going to start, like, making two covers for books. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what that means, but I feel like that's going to happen. Then there are the unintentional injuries and internal logic that can be unwittingly inflicted upon the mass continuity by such a venture, whatever the individual merits of the creators or their efforts, purely by the vast organizational problems that a project of this size seems to encounter. To explain what I mean, I should perhaps look at the series that I have read, that being Marvin George's excellent Crisis on Infinite Earths. Although the motive was pure and the true aim with regard to Crisis, I can't help feeling that somewhere along the line in the attempt to consolidate and rationalize the DC cosmos, a situation even more potentially destabilizing and precarious was created. Instead of a parallel Earth cosmology that was, if the reader was sensible enough to overlook obvious discrepancies at what they were, i.e. simple mistakes, relatively easy to understand, in the wake of the crisis and related seismic impacts upon the continuity such as John Byrne's new Superman books, we have a situation far less defined and precise. In the wake of the time altering at the end of the crisis, we are left with a universe where the entire past continuity of DC for the most part simply never happened. While I understand that Paul is attempting to sort out the Legion Superboy problems over in LSH at the moment, and that other writers are tackling similar discrepancies, the fact remains that by far the larger parts of DC's continuity will simply have to be scrapped and consigned to one of Orwell's memory holes, along with a large amount of characters who, more than simply being dead, are now unpeople. Again, this is a thing that is so funny to me, where he's like seeing the writing on the wall. Like Alan Moore is basically being like, hey guys, I know we had continuity problems before. We had to do crisis to try and figure out, sort everything out, put everything all neat and tied up with a bow. But now since we've just jettisoned like large decade long runs in our continuity, that fucks everything up. And now it's going to be like a very dangerous kind of like nuclear arms race where now our only solution is going to be continually going back to this idea of as he puts it unpeopling characters or repeopling them and then unpeopling them again when the rear base gets too low which is exactly what happens like a hundred percent everything he's outlining here is not like oh i'm worried about this abstract thing it's like oh no it's it's exactly the problem you know who else got unpeopled debo vid 18 R.I.P. DeboVid18. I believe this is dangerous for a couple of reasons. Firstly, by establishing the precedent of altering time, you are establishing an unconscious context for all stories that take place in the future, as well as for those which took place, or rather didn't take place, in the past. The readers of Long Standing, somewhere along the line, are going to have some slight feeling that all the stories that they followed avidly during their years of involvement with the books have been in some way invalidated, that all those countless plot lines weren't leading to anything more than what is in some respects an arbitrary cutoff point. 
By extension, the readers of today might well be left with the sensation that the stories they are currently reading are of less significance of moment because, after all, at some point 10 years in the future, some comic book omnipotent, be it an editor or the specter, can go back in time and erase the whole slate, ready to start again. I myself felt something similar at the end of the first Superman film, when he turns time back to save Lois. It ruined the small but genuine enjoyment that I'd got from the first movie and destroyed all credibility for any of the following sequels as far as I was concerned. He's fucking roasting him. This, this, is, this is an Alan Moore roast that could only could be roasted by Alan Moore. I know that the average eight-year-old reader in the street is not thinking these things consciously while buying his monthly batch of titles. Probably the average 17 or 25 year old reader isn't either, although that's more open to debate. My point is that the large and largely incomprehensible tides of public favor or dismissal that determine the success of a title are often influenced by very subtle things far below the waterline. I don't think it's too highfalutin to assume, for example, that the current success of the teenage superhero group book was more than a little to do with the current massive sense of instability pervading our culture, especially with respect to instabilities in the family structure. I firmly believe that both this and the current seeming obsession with a strictly formal continuity are some sort of broad response from an audience whose actual lives are spent living in a continuity far more uncertain and complex than anything ever envisaged by a comic book. I believe that one of the things that the comic fan is looking for in this multi-title crossover epic is some sense of sanely ordered cosmos not offered to him or her by the news headlines or the arguments of their parents over breakfast. It's kind of funny because like, I feel like he's pretty right. Like, like I'm reading this, I'm just like preach. And I feel like this is like this kind of stuff that we would talk about. Not that I'm like, oh, you know, we're we're fucking as smart as this or whatever. But like, we, this is the kind of stuff we talk about, like the way that we interpret art and th things that th the subjects of our episodes do. But you know that the people reading this are just like, what is this fucking bullshit? Like, I just need some people in tights like flying around. Come on, buddy boy, let's get it going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think Paul Levitz is a pretty smart dude, and I think he totally gets where Alan Moore is coming from. Well, it's not even like saying that there's like that whole characterization of like the like wisecracking New Yorkers maybe wrong, but I, I I don't mean like oh these people are dumb and they don't get it, but I just mean like when you are a businessman, you're you're not thinking about the underlying like seismic shifting of culture you're just it, it, things are like numbers <laughs> that's that's what it is to you um that isn't to say that it's healthy or necessarily desirable to fulfill this fundamentally escapist sort of urge i myself would feel uncomfortable if the imaginary reality i was offering my readers was intended as a pacifier rather than as something to make them think about their own reality i'd cite watchmen as an example of how it's possible to fulfill the requirements of a continuity much more strict and rigidly defined than is usual while still making some sort of relevant point, hopefully, about the real world that the book readers are living in. Attendant to this, there are a number of people in the industry, and in my opinion, they have a good case, even if I'm undecided about the right means to carry it off, who feel that it's time to break down the continuity and try to get rid of a lot of the rather anal and obsessive attitudes that have been allowed to dominate the marketplace and to some degree have hindered it in its periodic attempts to be taken seriously. I suppose a shining example of this would be Frank's Dark Knight, which, while it doesn't seem bothered about fitting into any graven in-stone continuity, does service to the legend of Batman and brilliantly redefines the character for an 80s audience. And nobody seems to care much how this all fits into the continuity because it's such a bloody good story. Will Jason Todd really die? Will all the superheroes leave Earth to su- Will Jason Todd really die? Will all the superheroes leave Earth to Superman and his government pals? Will Oliver Queen really get his arm burned off at the elbow at a fight with Clark Kent and become an embittered urban terrorist? Who cares? The readers seem quite capable of accepting that this may or may not happen in the future without getting worked up and starting to chew through their own arms over how the idea of alternate possible futures fit into this crisis idea that there is only one time stream with no possibility of alternate past, presents, or futures. Okay, so on one hand, we have an audience thirsty for the stability that an ordered continuity gives them, and on the other hand, we have good creative reasons for throwing continuity to the winds altogether. Is there any way that these two apparently conflicting notions can both be accomplished at once? Yes, I believe there is. I think it is possible to create a limited run series that would embrace both these attitudes comfortably and fulfill all the other requirements that we've gone over concerning crossovers of this type before. 
I think we come up with a story that, like Legends, casts new light upon all the DC characters and yet does no violence to however their creators and current creative teams are handling them in their own titles. The thing that's really interesting to me about how he's framing this, just in terms of like a creative person framing stuff to business people, and granted he's dealing with Paul Levitz, who's also a writer and a creative person, but like, you know, this document's going to get passed around to a lot of people that aren't actual comics creators, is that he's doing a really good job of outlining both the business realities of the world that the book is going to be put out in and the creative needs that are undergirding or overlapping those um, business necessities. So he's he's like showing you the problems and pitching you the solution at the same time as opposed to just kind of like outlining this is what I want to do and this is why I think it's cool. He's saying these are the needs that we have and this is how this story is going to solve those needs. Yeah, in just like an insanely procedural way to the point where you're just like, we've been reading all this time and he's finally just getting to like what this all has to do with a pitch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something that pulls together the threads of the DC universe in an interesting and revealing way, while at the same time remaining simple enough in construction so that the chances for any screw-ups in the crossover continuity are diminished or avoided altogether. This last point is important. Looking at the practicalities of the situation with the insight that Crisis has afforded us, it is possible to see the various practical problems which have emerged and which are unlikely to be solved by vigorous debating between the parties or sides involved. Firstly, there will almost certainly be some writers or artists who do not really want to involve their stories with the crossover, whether they say so or not, making them toe the line if they're vocal about it or taking comfort from the fact that most people, even if they don't like the idea, will go along with it for the sake of a quiet life clearly isn't practical when you're dealing with writers and artists. If they aren't motivated by an idea, while it is theoretically possible to force them to adapt to it, it isn't possible to ensure that you'll get better than a mediocre story out of them, thus cheapening the whole overall concept to some degree. It seems to me much more workable to come up with a concept by means of which whatever individual writers choose to do or not to do in their own books will have relevance to the crossover, whether they necessarily intend it to or not. If they choose to involve themselves actively in the crossover, then that's fine. If they refuse to do so, then the very act of refusing to do anything about the crossover also becomes part of the overall storyline, without doing any violence to the continuity of the books involved at all. If the mechanics of how all this is to be achieved seem a little far-fetched at this stage, then I'd ask you to bear with me until after the story outline, at which point I will attempt to demonstrate how the outline fulfills the various criteria that I'm defining here, including the next pertinent area on our agenda after the demands of commerce and continuity have been covered this being the purely creative opportunities and pitfalls involved just pitching baby he's just out here pitching yeah and he's like anticipating every question this is like this is like how you have to say anything on social media now where you're just like you have to put like five sentences of like not that i'm saying this and not that i'm saying this and i'm not trying to say this but and then you say your thing he was doing that back in back in 1987 He's just, he's just, he's just like writing, typing feverishly with a cigarette in his mouth, picturing an entire boardroom of people being like, no, no, and he's like, just bear with me, just bear with me, typing at breakneck speed. Yeah. It's hermetically sealed. Nobody can scientifically say no to this. (laughs) Yeah. If somebody says no to this, God himself will crack the sky and rend us into hell. (laughs) He's just like, those motherfuckers at DC, they can try and disagree, but they'd be wrong. (laughs) It's fucking illegal to say no to this now. I've made every caveat possible. They'll never see me come in. And the, it like gets there and Paul Levitz is like, Jesus, this is like 40 pages. I don't want to read all this. I'll just read the story part. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's like, crack the sky. Crack the sky. <laughs> Creatively, there's an immediate aesthetic problem in the multi-title crossover in that, badly put, it is very easy to strain the credibility of the entire universe by putting certain characters next to each other. 
Swamp Thing and Blue Devil spring immediately to mind, or Sergeant Rock and the legions of superheroes. In such juxtapositions, the flawed seams of the illusion of unity that we're trying to create become most apparent, and some thought would be given to a way of avoiding this distracting effect. There is also the very real possibility that any storyline involving so many characters in more than a superficial fashion is going to degenerate into incoherence and gibberish, becoming a sort of comic book babble of difficult to explain powers and origins and characterizations topped off with a muddy cosmic conclusion, some of which I feel that I certainly fell prey to in my recent Crisis in Heaven American Gothic conclusion in Swamp Thing and am anxious to avoid repeating here. The creative plus side of the equation is more dependent upon the tastes and leanings of the creative people involved. In this instant myself and whoever we get to draw this thing and work with me on it. For my part, speaking purely subjectively for the moment, what I'd like to do creatively with the series above and beyond to creative satisfaction to me and in fulfilling all the criteria above is to create a storyline that lent the whole superhero phenomenon, the whole cosmos and concept, a context that was intensely mythic and we extracted from the characters involved in it their last ounce of mythic potential, aiming at coming up with something that cements the link between superheroes and the gods of legend by attempting something as direct and resonant as the original legends themselves. One legend in particular will be the main thematic drift of the storyline, this being the Norse legend of Ragnarok, Twilight of the Gods, the storyline itself. Finally. Finally, we're here, baby! Ten hours in. <laughs> 30 years later. Actually, people don't know this, but you know how whenever you download an app, like you get Facebook or TikTok or you, you do a software update on anything and there's the that terms of service that you that you pops up and you agree and you just click agree without reading it. Alan Moore writes all of those. <laughs> That's what he did after leaving the comics industry. He's like, I'm just going to write these terms of service. And they're all like this. <laughs> he's like, he's like the, the inherent problem with posting your pictures on the internet publicly is that anybody can take them. And then hypothetically, in the future, somebody can take a big mass of these photos you've uploaded that you've given away for free. And then they can combine them and use some kind of futuristic technology to like recreate you as like a deep fake and then start posing as you and doing things and accusing you of crimes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's exactly what he does. Yeah, that's that's what he's been doing. <laughs> he, that's why he turned down the Watchmen movie money, because he was just like, I've got all the money I need from Daddy Apple. <laughs> I love writing these. My true medium is Apple Terms of Service. Ten years from now, he's like, I fucking told you all. I told you all. You didn't read the terms of service. I warned you. I warned you about doing this. <laughs> you shouldn't have ticked your talks. <laughs> okay. Assuming that six pages is enough for preliminaries, we'll now move to a discussion of the storyline itself. Please bear in mind that firstly, since the story has time travel as one of its central motifs, it's often difficult to present events in a clear chronological sequence without getting muddled for which I apologize in advance. Secondly, since I myself don't have all the fine details filled in yet, unless those details occur to me over the course of this writing, which often happens, then there are going to be a few areas where the plot is maybe fuzzy or the storyline seems flatter and less inspiring than the areas around it. I hope these don't detract too much from your enjoyment of the idea, since these will be things that will be polished up to their final shine in the actual script writing. I'd again cite Watchmen as an example of how much of this stuff only finds its way in at the final draft stage and ask your indulgence wherever necessary. To kick off, I should perhaps explain the overall structure of the story, which, incidentally, I'm currently imagining as something in the Watchmen format. 12 issues long, 28 pages, no ads, although these are just working assumptions and are certainly open to alteration at this early stage. The story is structured so there is a central core narrative, which in this case is the tale of the Twilight of the Superheroes. Taking place at some point in the not too distant future, say 20 or 30 years, around this there is a sort of framing narrative, a device which links these hypothetical future events with what is going on in the DC continuity at present. This device provides the sort of interface between the fairly self-contained story of Twilight and the numerous fairly self-contained storylines and continuities of the DC cosmos and it is achieved as follows. We have agents in the future who have managed to send a message back to agents in the present day DC continuity, urging them to warn the superhero community of the terrible future that is possibly waiting for them and to avoid it if at all possible. This is not without its own ambiguities as we shall hopefully see, but it provides for the moment the easiest conceptual handle with which to grasp the mechanics of all this. 
Thus, the agents in the present set about reaching various superheroes in the present and delivering the warning. Some of those who are warned heed the warning and make decisions in their current doings and lifestyles that will hopefully avert what is to happen in the future, even though this is by no means definite. Others will ignore the warning and carry on with what they are doing, which of course has some relevance, even by default, to the outcome of this horrific god or dumarong, waiting in the potential future. Some of the superheroes affected will perhaps not be reached at all and thus remain ignorant of the whole thing, although this too obviously has relevance to the outcome of what will happen in the future. I hope this makes it comprehensible how I hope to solve the problems of writers, artists who don't really want to involve themselves in the storyline. Even if they choose to have their characters remain oblivious to everything going on or to ignore it, their actions are having an implied relevance upon what is going on in the crossover book, while at the same time, what happens in the crossover book down the line in the future will be seen as having a direct relevance to how those characters are perceived in their own books. Knowing the fate of characters and even a potential future lends them a sort of poignance, which is very important and which I will take a few moments to discuss. Ah. Ah. Yeah, just like, yeah, that's, that's, that's clever. <laughs> Alan Moore, man, he's out here. He's working five-dimensional chess. Everybody else, they're playing normal chess. He's playing that weird chess from Star Trek where Spock has, like, multiple layers of chess that go on at the same time. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw as soon as you started saying that, like, some of the heroes will heed the warning and some of them will ignore it. I was like, oh, that's how he's going to answer for the, whether writers want to participate in the crossover or not. Like I'm saying, man, he's like a brilliant business dude in this context and also creative. Like he's, he's playing both sides of the line, which is interesting because I feel like in later eras of his career, he's just been so fed up with the business side of stuff that he's just like, I'm not fucking dealing with this shit. And like made, frankly, bad dis- business, business decisions because he just didn't have the bandwidth to, to do it. Yeah, you know what else Alan Moore hasn't been dealing with in the recent years? Fucking book shipments. Where's my book from that Kickstarter project I backed, Alan? What what cap? What Kickstarter was this? The uh, it was like Cinematica. Cinem- uh, Alan Moore. Cine- Cinemat. Cinema Purgatorio. Oh, that book is out. I never. I never got mine though. I would send them bitches a send them bitches a DM because that book is out, baby. No, I, I mean I know it. It came out years ago, but I never. They never sent me my copy that I paid for. So send them a message, bro. They're all probably dead. <laughs> hey, that's not funny. Uh, Kevin O'Neill literally just died like three weeks ago. I was right. It's fucked up, man. Not supposed to be funny. I was just. It was accurate. It's fucked up, man. <laughs> And also now I can't I can't message them. That'd be rude. All right, we're going on with the pitch. We're moving on. We're moving on. As I mentioned in my introduction to Frank's Dark Knight, one of the things that prevents superhero stories from ever attaining the status of true modern myths or legends is that they are open-ended. And essentially, an essential quality of a legend is that the events in it are clearly defined in time. Robin Hood is driven to become an outlaw by the injustices of King John and his minions. That is his origin. He meets Little John, Friar Tuck, and all the rest and forms the Merry Men. He wins the tournament in disguise. He falls in love with Maid Marian and thwarts the Sheriff of Nottingham. That is his career, including love interest, major villains, and the formation of a superhero group that he is part of. He lives to see the return of Good King Richard and is finally killed by a woman, firing a last arrow to mark the place where he shall be buried. That is his resolution. You can apply the same paradigm to King Arthur, Davy Crockett, or Sherlock Holmes with equal success. You cannot apply it to most comic book characters because in order to meet the commercial demands of a continuing series, they can never have a resolution. Indeed, they find it difficult to embrace any of the changes in life that the passage of time brings about for these very same reasons, making them finally less than fully human as well as falling far short of true myth. Even when he starts the pitch, he's not starting the pitch. He just keeps preamble, man. Just preamble for days. Let's get to the fucking story now, guys. Um, so anyway, the reason why comic books can never become myths. I mean, he's right, though. I think he is right. And and that's also a, a reason why they kind of tell the same six stories over and over and over again with these characters, which is something that I think for some people is very it's very it's comfort food. You know, it's they know what they're getting there. It's a it's a rhythmic kind of cyclical thing that people enjoy. And then for other people, I think it's like, okay, but I want to see things grow and evolve and really change. And they can't really change because there's no definitive ending. So there's no real third act. So there's no real second act. So everything's in this permanent just kind of stasis. And then I'm not wearing hockey pads. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that too. The joy of hockey pads. I'm not wearing Gucci sweatpants. <laughs> the reason this all came up in the Dark Knight intro is that I felt that Frank had managed to fulfill that requirement in terms of Superman and Batman. 
giving us an image which, while perhaps not their actual deaths, showed us how they were at their endings in their final years. Whether this story will actually ever happen in terms of real continuity is irrelevant. By providing a fitting and effective capstone to the Batman legend, it makes it just that. A legend rather than an endlessly meandering continuity. It does no damage to the current stories of Batman in the present, and indeed it does the opposite by lending them a certain weight and power by implication and association. Every minor shift of attitude in the current Bruce Wayne's approach to life that might be seen in Batman or Detective over the next few years, whether intentionally or not, will provide twinges of excitement for the fans who can perceive their contemporary Batman inching ever closer to the intense and immortal giant portrayed in the Dark Knight Chronicles. It also provides a special poignance. While I was doing some of the episodes of Under the Hood for the Watchmen text backup, and especially upon seeing Dave's mock-up photographs of the Minutemen in their early innocent days, I felt as if I'd touched upon that sense of, look at them all being happy. They didn't know how it would turn out. That one sometimes gets when looking at old photographs. Dark Knight does this for Batman to some degree, and I'd like to try to do the same for the whole DC cosmos in Twilight. I feel that by providing a capstone of the type mentioned above, but one which embraces the whole DC universe rather than just a couple of its heroes, I can lend a coherence and emotional weight to the notion of a cohesive DC universe thus fulfilling the criteria set out in my ramblings about the effect of all of this on the idea of DC continuity as mentioned above. Being set in a possible future, it does nothing that cannot be undone, and yet at the same time has a real and tangible effect upon the lives and activities of the various characters in their own books and their own current continuities. At the same time, by providing that capstone and setting the whole continuity into a framework of complete and whole legend, as Frank did in Dark Knight, we make the whole thing seem much more of a whole with a weight of circumstance and history that might help to cement over any shakiness left in the wake of crisis and its ramifications. Even if we pull the threads of these various characters' circumstances together at some hypothetical point in the future, this does imply that there is a logical pattern or framework for the whole DC universe, even if the resolution of the pattern is at a point 30 years in the hypothetical future. This also fulfills the criteria that I outlined in my opening paragraphs concerning the commercial application of the idea. The framing device which links the central story of Twilight to its potential crossover points with mainstream DC Universe, it's constructed so as to be detachable from the whole. While the whole story presented in the actual comic will have cutaways to what is going on in the present to show how the crossovers work, the main storyline of Twilight will be working towards its resolution unimpeded. Thus, in order to make the central storyline comprehensible to a wider audience than the trivia-mesmerized hordes of comic fandom, the link with the present can be ignored and effectively severed leaving only a powerful and simple central story idea, that of an apocalypse for Superfolk played out by warring factions against the fascinating backdrop of a drastically altered future. With all the plotting romance and intrigue of one of those stirring historical dramas about warring factions amongst the Medici or whatever. This central idea, that of a war and all its spectacular ramifications, makes it ideal material for a role-playing game. Perhaps the ultimate superhero role-playing game. It also lends itself nicely to a wide range of other spin-off projects, including those in the Toy Soldier range. The apocalyptic mood of the series tied in with current preoccupations and encapsulated in a phrase like the previously mentioned Waiting for Twilight could work nicely with regard to the advertising campaign as well as giving us a range of credible adult items such as badges, posters, and t-shirts. The storyline would hopefully be resonant enough to provide a good springboard for new characters or revitalize old characters, and this again would work seamlessly when it came to actually orchestrating all this. A character who hasn't been set yet, say Barbara Randall's proposal for a female Flash, could be presented in Twilight as an old established character who's been in the Justice League for years. When the character appears on the newsstands in her own title some months later, this should strike a suitably ominous resonance back to the Twilight storyline. Is it all coming true? Even if it doesn't all come true in every detail, even if, say, she never joins the Justice League, mightn't most of it come true? This is the sort of feedback effect that I want to foster. In addition to that, any changes that writers have planned for their characters in the future could be hinted at directly as having happened in the past, so that when they actually happen in the regular comic book, they have a meaning beyond that which they have on the surface. Even if plans change and certain things don't materialize as planned, then even that has its implications with regard to the future proposed in Twilight, especially after certain key ambiguities that will be introduced in the final issues of the proposed crossover. 
All right, uh, you go ahead and read that the Alan's new pitch, um, but make sure we have this meeting in uh, seven hours. And at this meeting, we're going to be deciding what what we do with the future of Watchmen. You know, we have that that deal with Alan where he retains the rights back to it once it goes out of publication. So we're having a meeting where whether we're going to decide whether we're going to take it out of publication or just have it go into publication forever, effective effectively screwing him out of our, the deal. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to vote to end the publication and do right by Alan. I'll be there in seven hours. Let me just read this pitch real quick. <laughs> oh, no, I missed the meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's really a, it's really a bummer when you you see the little details of this. Like the reason for, for context, anybody who doesn't know, the reason why he keeps mentioning role playing games is because they made a Watchmen licensed product role playing game that Alan Moore was involved in making and wrote a bunch of additional world building documents for um and got they got paid for it you know like they they own watchmen they thought they owned watchmen and so dc gave them this big you know royalty payment because of the uh, role-playing game turns out later that uh, they got screwed out of the owning of watchmen because of a clause in the contract that said dc owned it while it was in print and then once it went out of print six months later it would revert to more in gibbons and so the reason why he's like hi- hyped up on all of these like you know we can make toys we can make buttons we can make all this stuff is because they're seeing payments or they are under the idea that they are going to see payments every time there is um you know a button produced or a badge produced or a t-shirt produced and uh spoiler alert that doesn't happen they get screwed out of a lot of stuff dc doesn't treat them very well but at yeah, this point, aside from aside from my joke of him genuinely trying to like do right by him and just missing the meeting, they're just reading this and just being like, "You poor, poor child." Well, they don't. They didn't know either. Nobody knew that the that the contract was going to end up screwing them this way, and then they didn't make the deal better. Is really the the thing. Um, they chose the money over a continued relationship with Alan Moore, um, which is really a travesty when you look at this document and see how much thought and uh, excitement. I think this would have generated within the industry, and I think it still would be viewed as one of the best crossovers ever. Like it's it's so well thought out, which we'll see as we get to the story, <laughs> which we have not yet learned because not a single story element has actually been explained yet. I should also point out, if only to start a new paragraph, I just noticed I didn't draw breath on the last one. That the fact that the meat of Twilight's central storyline is detachable from the crossover device means that. Should anyone see any potential in the ultimate superhero movie, bearing in mind that DC currently own almost all of the really important superhero icons and printed on the mass consciousness and could thus perhaps come up with something that legitimately laid claim to that title, then it will be simple to detach the central idea from the off-putting clutter of a massive continuity, such as would almost certainly alienate the average non-comic moviegoer. I'm talking about characters such as Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, the Marvel family, Black Hawk, Plastic Man, the Shadow, and all the other classic and publicly recognizable characters that DC are fortunate enough to have access to. Handled in the right way with the inclusion of these classic figures, the Twilight storyline could be printed as a spectacular and epic finale to the whole essential superhero dream. Like I say, anyway, it never hurts to consider these angles, just in case. Okay, so now that the actual mechanics of this linking framing device have been discussed, perhaps it would help if I told you what they actually are. Bear in mind that the details of this are subject to change as long as the overall idea is sound since I'm not absolutely sure about forthcoming events in the DC Universe that might invalidate some of this. I'm confident that there will be ways around such problems anyway, so the following should still be fairly sound and useful. The first thing we do is to solve the paradox mentioned earlier concerning does Dark Knight really happen in the future, and the attendant schism between those who want a concrete universe and those who want endless possibility free of the restrictions of a rigid cross-title continuity. At the same time, I'd also like to put right something that has bothered me since the resolution of Crisis, namely the fact that I actually like parallel world stories and that a lot of other creative people enjoy the freedom that gives them too. Some of the better stories in DC's history have been those directly related to the idea of alternate Earth, including Crisis itself, paradoxically enough. And there are a lot of brilliant imaginary stories which display the same urge and the same ideas at work, albeit outside mainstream continuity. 
What I propose is something that would allow for the possibility of alternate world stories as well as the possibility of revisiting old discarded continuities that still have charm without opening up the whole Earth 1 through 15 problem that prompted the crisis in the first place. It will also be an idea central to the whole concept of this framing slash linking device, which we connect the events of Twilight with the current continuity. What I propose basically is something like the following, subject to input by any creative people with prior claims on the characters I'm suggesting, of course. Firstly, I understand that there will be some restriction upon time travel in the revised point crisis continuity, which is all well and good by me. To consolidate the importance of these restrictions and their reverberations upon the various books that use time travel as a motif, I suggest that as an example, some members of the Legion of Superheroes should volunteer for a reconnaissance mission exploring the time stream and testing its new limits with regard to their vehicles. Those Legionnaires might be selected for this that me and Paul have agreed between us are appropriate. At the same time, in any other books that might have time travel problems, it could be mentioned in passing that from our own era, Professor Rip Hunter was currently investigating the phenomenon in his time top. Okay, now if Paul and Karen and everybody else involved are amenable to this, then I figure the next step is to introduce a scheme by the time trapper. I'm just going to skip to the part where we, we've been we've been rickrolled like three times of this not actually being the story. I'm just going to go to the part where it's actually the story. <laughs> okay, I think that's about it as far as the character sketches go. So I'll get down to a sketchy outline of the central plot. This is the area I have the least worked out in detail, although I have the overall picture pretty clearly. So maybe I'll just trust to luck and hope it comes together as I go along. If not, I hope you'll bear with me and I'll clarify and polish the weak points at some later date. As before, since the plot comes in two sections with the central narrative and the framing linkings device, I'll discuss the plot in two parts for the sake of greater clarity, starting with the description of the events that make up the framing sequence. As before, since this is a time travel story, telling things in a chronological sequence is sometimes difficult to do without getting muddled, but I'll give it my best shot, the framing device. See, even even as we get to the story, he had to it had to not be the story. <laughs> he had to get us one last time. The plot of the framing device is as follows. The story starts as it's ending in a one-page prologue that takes place at the end of 1987 in a bar someplace in New York. John Constantine sits drinking alone, looking very bitter and pissed off at somebody or other. A striking and personable blonde enters the bar and, noticing Constantine, leans over and asks him for a light. Constantine, sitting there with a crumpled letter in one bunched fist and a glass in the other, glances up at her and then stares at her as if transfixed. We close up on his face and then move into flashback. Basically, the whole series is what passes through Constantine's mind in the two seconds it takes him to respond to the girl asking him for a light. We flash back to the beginning of 1987, when Constantine is surprised by a visit from Rip Hunter, who he doesn't know but who appears to know everything about Constantine, including some very personal details that Constantine has never told a living soul about. Intrigued, Constantine listens to Hunter's story. Hunter tells him about how he's been marooned in time for subjective months, stranded at the House of Tomorrow in the world of Twilight. Hunter tells him about how, in this world, he had met up with an older version of John Constantine who was somehow instrumental in Hunter's escape back to his own time after the events to be chronicled in Twilight have concluded. This elder Constantine, explaining about the flux that exists in the time stream, explains that there is a better than good chance that of the potential future Earths waiting in the fluke down the time stream from our present, this future Earth is the most likely to actually happen, with all of its chaos and carnage. It's a world of war, and it ends with all of the super Earth beings being killed or exiled from Earth forever. Giving Hunter enough personal information to convince the younger Constantine and get him to aid Hunter in his mission to alert the people concerned and avert this nightmare future, the elder Constantine sends Hunter back in time with his dire story of horrors waiting in the future that must be averted. Hearing Hunter's tale, although the readers don't hear it all at first, Constantine the Younger is convinced enough to help the time traveler contact some of the various personages affected and tell them the bits of the story that are relevant to them, maybe in their own books or maybe in Twilight itself. This framing device has its own resolution, but I'll leave that till later. The central plot. This is the main central plot of Twilight, being the story that Hunter tells Constantine and that Constantine passes on to the other parties involved, and it deals with the world of the Twilight. I don't have it broken down issue by issue or anything, but the rough shape is something like this. In the middle 1995 or earlier, when society was starting to break down, many of the villains on Earth tried to take advantage of this situation by exploiting the uncertainty and disaster. Incensed by this, the current Justice League decided to go on the offensive for the first time and plan a careful campaign that will remove all the supervillains forever. They enlist the aid of a lot of other superheroes in this, and they are mostly very effective. So effective, in fact, that they begin to be seen as the only effective force for reason and order in a fast-crumbling world. This goes to the assembled heroes' heads a little, 
and in an attempt to secure their new power base, they pass a majority motion outlawing aliens from Earth. While this is passed and is rigorously enforced, it is one of the decisions that causes the first serious rift in the ranks of the assembled superdoers, with some small groups like the Titans starting to drift away from the main group. This process continues until the state of the ruling house is pretty much as described above, with the House of Secrets containing the only supervillains to survive the purge other than those who reformed, and the House of Lanterns demolished upon Earth and temporarily relocated upon Mars pending the planned secret invasion. At the start of our story proper, there is quite a lot of different activity going on in the various camps. The House of Steel and Thunder, each suffering their own internal stresses, are preparing for the marriage of the delinquent Superboy with Mary Marvel Jr., daughter of the Captain and Mary Sr. This is a development that causes considerable anxiety all over the place. Can you believe it? We're doing it. We're in the story, baby. We're in the story. I th I mean, I thought I thought we would be there forever. I did too. I thought that we were going to get there like three times. Yeah. I thought we were just going to get lost in a never-ending loop of just, like, hearing Alan Moore's, like, s labyrinthian justifications for the universe, basically. He was just going to start to, he was going to start to slowly, like, unpack how the universe worked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. But with every, beginning of every paragraph, he was like, okay, let's get to the story. And then continually just to unpacking the universe. It just it just ends up being the universal theory of everything solved. He's like, so yeah, so um, yeah, I guess that's how you achieve cold fusion. Uh, so let's get to the story. Finally, <laughs> previously, even the two most powerful houses could not attempt to exert any pressure upon the others for fear that the other houses would unite against them. Both houses knew that individually they couldn't hope to take on the assembled might of the Titans, Justice League, and others. This preserved a status quo of sorts. However, with the prospect of the alliance in the offing. It seems quite possible that the assembled forces of three people with the power of Superman, four people with the power of Captain Marvel, and Wonder Woman into the bargain could easily smash the most firm resistance. This prospect worried both the Houses of Titans and Justice tremendously. It also worries the villains remaining at the House of Secrets who remember back to the purge of the 90s and shudder. It certainly alarms the people living in the barrio who, though downtrodden, still have a certain amount of liberty, impoverished though it may be and are not actually living under the absolute dictatorship that could result from a marriage between the House of Steel and Thunder. The other major party alarmed by the prospect are the assembled alien forces that are conspiring out of the moon of Mars. They don't like the thought of a planet ruled by an unstoppable superhuman elite purely because it might very quickly pose a threat to the aliens' own well-being. Their plan is cryptic, but we learn a bit of it at a time. The main thrust of their plan is that they intend to use Adam Strange's place as their agent on Earth to set up a Zeta Beam link to which an inviting army of Hawk people, superpowered Green Martians, and members of the Green Lantern Corps could materialize in the center of Times Square or somewhere. This plan being linked to a Thanagarian plan that has to be abandoned in the current issues of Swamp Thing, resurrected here to much more spectacular purpose. Okay, so that's the rough background. Down at Sandy's, the bums are hanging out, Uncle Sam muttering in the corner, Plastic Man dropping by for a drink with Blackhawk before they go to cruise the bars uptown, Dollman scuttling around his vivarium and so on. Oliver and Dinah are publishing their newspaper, with the question occasionally dropping by for a political argument with Ollie or to pass on a bit of information. His current case is one that has him totally mystified. A midget turned up at a rough trade bar, was seen by witnesses, finally vanishing to an upstairs room with a very tall, very beautiful call girl that nobody had ever seen before. When the door was broken down, this after nobody had emerged from the room for several hours, the body of the midget was found and bound and gagged, with his neck broken by a single clean blow. The room was locked with no other possible exit. The call girl was gone. There was no murder weapon. This little conundrum will continue to puzzle them throughout the series until we get a few shaking revelations at the end. In the houses themselves, things are unsettled. At the House of Steel, both Superman and Super or Wonder Woman are worried about their delinquent son and his increasingly difficult to conceal tendencies towards sadism and sociopathic behavior. They are also worried about their daughter, who they cannot find a suitable suitor for, since Captain Marvel Jr. doesn't appear to be interested in her. Captain Marvel Jr.'s disinterest is largely due to the fact that he is madly and passionately in love with Mary Marvel Sr. and is liaising with her behind Captain Marvel Sr.'s back. Wait, so he's fucking his mom or his sister? Captain Marvel Jr is in love with Mary Marvel Sr. So yes, he's in love with his mom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> is there some kind of thing about incest? In well, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. So it's Captain Marvel Jr. Because Freddie Freeman is Captain Marvel Jr. And he's not. So I wonder if this is, I don't. Yeah, because there is a character named Captain Marvel Jr. Who is 
the original Captain Marvel sidekick, who's Freddie Freeman, not Billy Batson's biological son. He's like his best friend. But in this continuity, is Captain Marvel Jr. his actual son, or is he Freddie Freeman? I mean, it seemed like it was his son. And also, Captain Mar- Marvel is married to his sister. So I was just wondering if that was like a thing, like... Is incest a thing in Captain Marvel? No, it's more, I think, the playing off the idea that Captain Marvel comics are very innocent and very, like, primally happy and, and ebullient, uh, where... And Almore's like, he's gonna fuck his sister. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Captain, you know, Captain Marvel is very... Because, you know, Alan Moore, like, really came to prominence making Marvel Man Miracle Man, which is a r- blatant ripoff of Captain Marvel. And he, his whole idea was like, oh, we're going to do this Captain Marvel style, you know, golden age character that's smiling and bright and happy in a revisionist, deconstructionist way. You know, where Captain Marvel or uh, Kid Marvel Man, the the analog to Captain Marvel Jr. over there, Kid Marvel Man, like, becomes a super villain and, like, destroys an entire city by, like, collapsing villain, or collapsing city, collapsing sky rises, and, you know, it's super dark, and that's, like, the, the... And then he fucks his sister. <laughs> so I, I don't know if this is supposed to be Freddie Freeman or supposed to be a son of Captain Marvel. Well, I hope I hope it's his, his mom. Their relationship has grown difficult of late, largely because the increasingly erratic and cranky behavior of the captain seems to have taken a turn for the worse. All of the Marvel family have had problems with the fact that they have two sets of bodies, neither of which ever age in the slightest, but Mary and Junior have solved this by more or less giving up their human identities. This doesn't worry them, mainly because they are a lot closer to the age of their counterpart than, say, Billy Batson is to his alter ego. I should point out that for reasons I've yet to find a good explanation for, the Marvel family seems to grow in their superhuman forms to an ideal age and then stop. Thus, Mary and Junior are both around 25 in their superhuman forms, as is Captain Marvel himself, since he is already the ideal age and hasn't grown up any more in the intervening years. All three are still children if they happen to say Shazam, but the only one who still uses the word is the Big Red Cheese himself, unable to give up his human self as Mary and Junior have done. Hanging on to his Billy Batson identity has caused a lot of problems for the captain, as well as in his relationship with his wife, but these seem to have become a lot better recently. Now, however, there is a new element that is perhaps even more threatening. Whereas before Captain Marvel was wrapped up enough in his personal problems to leave Mary and Junior lots of time together, lately he has started to make more normal marital demands upon Mary's time. He's even being extra nice to her, which worries her like anything. There are other oddities of behavior. The captain will no longer go down and sit and talk with Mr. Talkie Tawny as had been a regular habit of his. In the midst of all this, there are problems with Mary J, who really doesn't want to marry Superboy at all. Talkie Tawny is the uh, talking tiger, if you're not familiar. He's my fave. I love him. In the background of all this, we see John Constantine moving around amongst the various characters, gathering a bit of information here and there, obviously conducting some plan that he had in mind. Remember, this is the older Constantine we're talking about here. He seems to be paying particular attention to the areas of stress between the various houses, and it becomes quickly apparent that although he's older, he's still up in the habit of manipulating people in various cryptic ways for reasons unclear to anyone but himself. As things progress, we see the paranoia concerning the coming wedding between the House of Steel and Thunder amongst the lesser houses start to come to a boiling point. The Titans, directed by a ruthless and embittered Nightwing, maybe approach the Justice League proposing that the two houses should join forces along with maybe the villains in this House of Secrets to stand against the possible threat of being overrun by the House of Steel and Thunder. Maybe an uneasy alliance is formed between the three houses, although the House of Mystery and Tomorrow are not at all interested in joining in. A plan starts to emerge for a masked attack upon the House of Steel and Thunder, perhaps even on the wedding day itself, in the hope that both houses can be eliminated and the country divided up between the victors. Meanwhile, we see Blackhawk continuing to recruit his new Blackhawks, and we see Constantine starting to step up his plan, making contact with more and more of the people he's going to need to accomplish it. For one thing, we see him finally manage to make contact with the elite council of the Shadow, the Batman, and maybe Doc Savage and Tarzan as well, and learn of their plan to oust all the superheroes from Earth. Constantine seems eager to help with this, although we aren't sure about how much of the double game he's playing. He also makes contact with Adam Strange, and through gaining Strange's confidence, learns of the aliens' planned attack upon Earth. 
Constantine seems eager to help with this plan as well. In fact, as Constantine brushes against the various groups involved, it becomes clear that he is promising his undivided assistance to all of them. It is maybe during this period that he calls at the House of Tomorrow and makes the acquaintance of Rip Hunter, who also figures in his plans. Beyond this, he also spends a lot of time hanging out with the question and around the offices of Black Feathers, seeming to be everywhere at once as he works his dubious and incomprehensible scheme. The thing I love about this so far <clears throat> is that even just from his description of what's happening, you really get a sense of like the scope and kind of the epicness of the story and how it's all of these different factions playing off against each other, people that have like grudges and alliances being pitted against each other in these really complex and interesting ways. And when we get to the, the payoff of what that cold open means... Oh, it's so satisfying. I just love it so much. And I've like almost put it in a book like three times. <laughs> I just, I love the like trope of untrustworthy guy roaming around, pitting people against each other, you know, whispering in people's ears, Grima worm tonguing around. I just love it. I love all of this. Yeah, like I said, I'd, I'd read this if it was a thing. As the plot builds up in momentum, it is this ingenious and baffling juggling act of Constantine's that becomes the main attraction. We see him urging on the Justice League Titans to their attack upon the House of Thunder and Steel, and yet we see him call at the House of Thunder and speak to Captain Marvel himself, telling him of the planned attack. This is a key scene. Constantine tells the Captain of the attack and asks him not to do anything to help the House of Steel in the thick of the battle. When the captain politely asks Constantine why he should do this when he is, after all, supposedly intending upon cementing the union between the House of Steel and Thunder, lighting a cigarette, Constantine smiles and says that he thinks the captain already knows what the reasons are. The captain flinches back from the match as Constantine strikes it with a look of terror which passes, changing into a smile at Constantine's cleverness. He agrees to go along with Constantine so far as it suits his own plans. While urging the Titans and Justice League to strike while the iron is hot, and simultaneously urging Captain Marvel not to defend his allies, Constantine is at the same time urging the Batman and Shadow group to hold in their attack upon the superpowers until a more advantageous time. After he has explained his plan to them, although not to the reader, they agree. On top of all this, Constantine is acting as a fifth columnist to the planned alien invasion through Adam Strange. He urges Strange to commence the alien invasion after the Titans and League and the House of Steel and Thunder have had a chance to weaken and decimate each other at the wedding. This sounds sensible, and they readily agree. As if this wasn't thoroughly confusing enough, Constantine also has a number of other irons in the fire. In the barrio, he is seen at various times searching for two people. One of these is the vanished metal man, Gold. The other is an old crippled man who is reputed to live somewhere in the barrio that nobody knows the history of. Eventually, Constantine finds both of these. Gold, after leading him on with some story or other, he tricks cruelly and has melted down. The old man, when he finds him, he is much more careful with. I don't know when I'll reveal the information, but this old man is in fact Metron, formerly of the New Gods, banished to Earth for some treachery that he's committed in the past when the temptation to uncover new knowledge became too much for the feeble moral restraints that he placed upon himself. What Constantine wants with Metron is fairly straightforward. He wants the Mobius chair, although we don't find out why until later. I should point out that these various plot threads will be spread out dramatically, intercut with developments in the lives of the other characters, so it won't all be about John Constantine. Endearing though, I obviously find him. For example, while planning their raid upon the House of Steel and Thunder, the assembled House of Titans, Justice and Secret, will attempt to press gang various heroes in the barrio with their army with mixed results. Some of the barrio heroes either reluctantly or willingly go along with the revolutionary houses, while some other people are enlisted by Constantine to aid in his master plan. When we finally have the various factions set up and defined, even if there are some ambiguous areas, we let the climactic fireworks commence. On the wedding day, the planned attack by the Titans, Justice League, and villains upon the House of Steel and Thunder gets underway. The losses are heavy upon both sides. Wonder Woman, the former Wonder Girl, is killed in battle by Superwoman, formerly Wonder Woman, who is herself killed by Captain Adam. Superboy is also killed, along with most of the Justice League, Titans, and supervillains. Captain Marvel, who has been expecting the attack after being warned by Constantine, is unharmed, while Captain Marvel Jr. and Mary Marvel decide to take advantage of the confusion to flee into space, where they hope to make a new home. Supergirl goes with them. This leaves only Captain Marvel and a badly battered Superman standing amongst the bruised and bloodied remnants of an army of beaten superheroes. The attempted coup by the Titans and League has been successfully repulsed, 
and three houses lie shattered, but all that remain of the two most powerful houses of all are the two archetypical superheroes, standing back to back, waiting for what's going to be thrown at them next. This turns out to be the alien invasion, arriving by Zeta Beam, an army of Hawkmen, Lanterns, and Martians pour into Earth and quickly get rid of what remains of the armies recruited by the House of Titans, Justice, and Secrets in their failed attempt at a coup. They then advance upon the main palaces. Superman isn't worried. Since with Captain Marvel by his side, the two of them should still be just about powerful enough to send the invaders packing. This is where the surprise card is played. Captain Marvel isn't Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel has been dead ever since the story opened. It had all started with little Billy Batson and his problem. There he was, unwilling to give up being human, still spending a lot of time in a child's body. The unfortunate thing was that though little Billy's body didn't age, his mind did. Trapped in a child's body, but afflicted with adult needs, Billy went quietly. Well, bats, I suppose. A lot of the problems were sexual. It's pretty, like, as, as much as we talked about the stuff earlier involving uh, sexual assault, <clears throat> this is a, to me, this is a pretty, I love Captain Marvel, and even I, who am not necessarily a big fan of the grim dark bullshit, I'm like, yeah, but that's, that's kind of cool, though. 1987, that would have blown people's minds. That would have been, been pretty wild in 1987. Physically, Billy was not capable of normal sex and thus pretty soon began to experiment with more bizarre variations such as S&M, visiting the appropriate bars and clothing that made him look as grown up as possible while he still had the face and body of a child. Oh shit, he was the little guy? At a certain club on a certain night, Billy had met a strikingly tall call girl who seemed to meet his every fantasy requirement. They went to a room upstairs together and locked it from within. Billy was tied up and then agreed to be gagged. At this point, the call girl began to melt and change shape, shimmering as if through a heat haze before Billy's startled eyes. In the end, instead of a six foot six human woman, Billy is staring at a seven and a half foot tall green Martian man. It is John Johns, the Martian Manhunter, on Earth incognito using his power of disguise. Billy, being gagged, cannot say Shazam and turned into Captain Marvel nor can he prevent the Manhunter snapping his neck with one blow of his hand. The Manhunter then walks out invisibly through the walls and leaves a dead little person in an unsoluble mystery. The Manhunter has assumed the captain's identity, being able to convincingly duplicate his powers in order to catch Superman by surprise when the alien invasion finally comes. This is why he flinched when John Constantine struck a match and why he didn't mind letting the three rebel houses and the House of Steel tear each other to bits. Oh shit. Yeah, dude. Oh shit! I didn't. I didn't say it before, but I was like, I was like, what? What is this story about this little person getting murdered by a hooker? Like, what? What's? What's? What is, where is this coming from? Yeah, yeah. When, when is this gonna fucking pay off? It all makes sense now. Upon realizing how he had been set up, Superman fights with Martian Manhunter, killing him with his heat vision. However, by this point, it is too late, and the assembled Martians and Green Lanterns have arrived. We have a powerful and intense sequence where Superman manages to smash his way through a lot of the alien forces single-handed while being ring-whipped by the Lanterns, only to be finally beaten to death in single combat by the massive and frighteningly powerful Sodal Yat. The alien invasion is a complete success, and the coalition forces of the Martians, Guardians, and Thangarians will now govern Earth forever and keep it nice and peaceful. It seems that in his dealings, Constantine's plan has gone awry, unless he actually meant to impose an alien dictatorship upon the Earth. It is at this point that the final pieces fall into place. The alien conquerors find themselves suddenly attacked by a small army of superheroes, these mostly being those recruited by Constantine as well as the forces of the Council made up of Batman, the Shadow, etc. Most of these are wearing thin golden armor made from the body of the unfortunate gold, which renders the otherwise impotent power rings of the Green Lanterns useless. The aliens are driven back and contained by the surprise attack of the others, and the battle seems to come to a Mexican standoff when one of the Hawk people or Green Lanterns points out that however valiantly the heroes fight, there is a massive army and combined extraterrestrial warriors ready to keep pouring onto the Earth until all resistance is squashed. It is at this point that Constantine plays his trump card. Using the Mobius chair of Metron, Constantine has visited the antimatter universe of Kord. In return for a firm promise of immunity for the planet Earth and its immediate system, Constantine has then sold them the secret of the boom tube, which he has also managed to wheedle from Metron. Thus, while the assembled aliens are preparing to pour into Earth via Zeta Beam, Thanagar, New Mars, Ran, and Oa are currently being overrun by a vast army of Cordian weaponeers. Stunned, the aliens are forced to return quickly to their respective homes to fight wars upon their own soil that may take them centuries to win if they win them at all. For the most part, the only heroes left on Earth are the non-powered variety, and most of these are more than prepared to take off their masks and go public. Constantine explains to them that under the guidance of the Batman, the Shadow, and all the rest, 
American society free of government or a super dictatorship will start to organize itself along different lines so that it can deal with the future without fear or anxiety. The days of the big powers are over, and henceforth America will be built up from much smaller and more flexible units, both socially and economically. The story of Twilight ends with a delighted John Constantine standing at the verge of a new utopia, free from the interferences of power, all superfolk banished from Earth forever. It's like a liber- libertarian's wet dream. All right, have you ever read Rand? You ever heard of a little book called The Fountainhead? Of course, the story that he gives to Rip Hunter to take back to his past self while it gives the gist of all of this doesn't give the whole story. This comes home to the younger Constantine right at the very end of the series when we wrap up the framing device. Somewhere earlier on in the continuity, we'll have a scene where somebody says to Constantine that if he isn't careful, one day he'll run into somebody craftier than himself and get into a whole mess of trouble, to which Constantine replies confidently and with some justification that there isn't anybody smarter than him. At the very end of the series, we find out differently. Having contacted all the hero groups and people involved and met with varying responses, Constantine is disturbed. Has he failed? Some of the people he warned have taken his advice, some haven't. Some he hasn't been able to reach at all. He's still thinking of this event in the future as being a terrible thing, and he fears that he might not have averted it well enough. All he has for consolation is the knowledge that, according to Hunter, at some point in his future, he's going to meet a woman who he will love very much for the rest of his life and who will fill a big, lonely hole in him. He even knows, thanks to Hunter, how he will meet her. She's going to come up to him in a bar and ask him for a light. Their eyes will meet, and that will be that. While he is musing over the pros and cons of his Hunter... While he is musing over the pros and cons of this, Hunter delivers the last part of his message from the future Constantine, which he has been instructed not to give to the younger Constantine until after he has warned as many people as he can. Surprised, Constantine reads what may turn out to be the ultimate Dear John letter. Written by his future self, the letter apologizes for using his younger self so cynically, but assures John, the younger, that it's all for the best. The older Constantine, having the advantage of hindsight, can remember everything that happened to his younger self, including meeting with Rip Hunter, getting told a terrible story and then launching on a mission to warn everybody affected of what waited in their future and how they might avert it. The other Constantine can't even remember how it all worked out. The world of Twilight came about anyway, often because of people's actions in response to his warnings. He can even remember getting a letter handed to him exactly the same as this one. He muses briefly over the paradox of who really wrote the letter originally before apologizing to his younger self again and consoling him with the fact that a wonderful woman is waiting in his near future and that she will be worth everything. Reading the letter, the younger Constantine is furious. It has turned out that there is someone craftier than John Constantine, namely John Constantine, 20 years older and smarter. Constantine has been conned by himself. Worse, since the person who tricked him is 20 years away in an unreachable future, Constantine has no way of getting vengeance upon the person who did this to him. Angered and enraged, he goes into a bar and sits with a crumpled letter in his hand, getting drunk. This is the end of the story, and we only have a final one-page epilogue that takes us back to the beginning, now that we've come full circle. The woman enters the bar and notices John, asking him for a light. He looks up and their eyes meet. She is beautiful. He knows instantly that he could love this woman forever, knows who she is, knows how happy him and all his future selves are going to be with her. And finally, perversely, he understands how he can get his vengeance against his future self, how he can avert the circumstances that lead to Twilight by throwing a small but important spanner into the works of destiny. Excuse me, have you got a light? Constantine looks at her and blinks twice before replying, No, I'm sorry, I don't smoke. The woman shrugs and after a while leaves the bar without speaking to Constantine any further. After she's gone, he sits, dead drunk, at a dimly lit corner table and cries his cold and cynical heart out. And that's it. I hope you can see how it's meant to fulfill all the requirements mentioned earlier. There are opportunities for new characters to get a springboard, old characters to get a shot in the arm, and all the merchandising you can handle in terms of games and stuff, and at least as I see it. The Warring House's idea sounds ideal for role-playing games, or maybe even a video game. The overall continuity is hopefully enhanced without being damaged in any irreversible way, and I think we might get a damn good yarn out of it in the bargain. Anyway, I seem to have gone on far longer than I intended, so I better wrap this up. I'll be looking forward with interest to hearing what any of you have to say about all of this when you've had a chance to read it. If any sections are incomprehensible and need clarifying, then please give me a call. Man, I love the idea that the only person that can outsmart John Constantine is John Constantine, and the only way to get revenge on future John Constantine is by depriving yourself of the love of your life. Yeah, to ruin his life, which is your life. Oh, man. That is so good. It is so good. You know how earlier in the pitch he talked about how looking at the drawings of the Minutemen back in the 
1940s, he got a glimpse of that feeling of like looking at old pictures and thinking like, oh, look, they look so happy. They didn't know what would happen. That's what this is. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Reading the pitch itself is, a, oh, they were so happy in 1987. Oh, he thought there was going to be games and toys and badges. He thought he was going to unite the continuity and solve its problems. And it was going to be drawn by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, which is like, <laughs> take me to there. Take me to there. That was that was pretty good. I I, l- I loved it. I love this idea. I really wish this had happened. Pretty, 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 pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty sad as an ending. And that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the idea that all of this fighting is just to get to a scene where a dude is crying in a bar. Like all of the like trappings of normal superhero stories of like the politics and the, you know, punching and the, oh, we melted down a metal man and made him into armor for everybody to wear. And the shadow teaches Batman how to be invisible and all this stuff. That's cool. But a guy crying in a bar. That's what I'm here for. And I, I, it's kind of funny. I mean, I don't want to spoil it. And also, we just don't have time to go in depth about this. But so I'll just say, go read it. But in some ways, the plotting of this is very it, like the story of it is nothing like it. But the plotting of it and the way that it plays out and like the, the the closed loop and the way that things come into play is kind of similar to the newest John Dies at the End book, which I, I think I talked about on a couple episodes ago. Um, but if you're reading this book, you're in the wrong universe. It's the third John dies at the end book. And it's, it kind of has, it kind of plays out like this in this way where at the end, you're just like, Oh my God, like it's all coming together. Ah, yeah, I, uh, go, go read it. I will. Yeah. So that leaves us with the question of why did it fall through? Moore pitched the book as a 12-part maxi-series in the same way that Watchmen had been produced. 28 pages an issue, no ads, all killer, no filler, as the kids say. However, it never came to be. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Alan Moore got pissed at DC for the way that they were treating him with Watchmen, and that's why this never happened, right? That's kind of true. However, best as I can tell, most of that friction wasn't until years later. Alan Moore, as well as Frank Miller and some other people were very upset at the idea that DC would institute a ratings system on their comics. So, for background, at the time, comic book shop owners were literally being arrested for selling mature comics to little kids. Literally. Dudes were going to jail for this. So, in order to protect these retailers, DC was going to start putting advisory labels saying this is a mature reader's book on the books. Miller, Moore, Wolfman, and others hated the idea. I know what you're thinking, but video games and movies have ratings. Alan Moore and Frank Miller and company would disagree with the premise of your argument, saying, name a piece of literature that has a rating on it. Ultimately, Moore and Miller left DC because Jeanette Kahn instituted a rating system. You can say a lot of things about Moore, but you can't say that he doesn't walk the walk. Taking a moral stance on the validity of a medium and choosing to walk away from a lucrative publishing relationship because of it? If that's not some badass snake worshiping bearded wizard shit, I don't know what is. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd be like, well, just say I'm rated I for I'm all in. Give me that book deal, baby. <laughs> I mean, I I get why they left a hundred percent, but also I want this book. I wish this book had happened. God damn it. Yeah, that's that's fucking that's some crazy shit. Would that have been like the craziest comic ever made? Like, is there anything crazier than that? Like in terms of scale, the way that it ties things together, like the characters that it utilizes, the way that it like attempts to m- like manipulate the status quo. Like, is there is there anything that's ever been that big? I mean, I think it's a different thing, but I think Crisis, uh, I think Crisis is even, it's a, it's a different type of bigger story, but it's a bigger story because it's like, you know, super complicated, you know, uh, universe ending, all of these, you know, you the anti-monitor collapsing multiple levels of reality and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it's a different thing because that comic is a comic about the publishing initiative of DC Comics specifically, whereas 
Twilight of the Superheroes is a different thing. It It's a smaller story while still being big and complicated, but it's a story that is concerned with attempting to propel these characters into mythic icons. Um, it's, it, it's also just kind of hard to know, like, if this book was made by Jose Luis, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, it would be the greatest fucking thing ever. But if it was made by Al Milgram... <laughs> Probably not as much. You know what I mean? Like, it, so it kind of just the goal of this book is what's so fascinating to me. The actual success rate of it could be great or could be, you know, not, you know, like Crisis, uh, not Crisis, um, uh, Infinity Gauntlet is a perfect example where like the first couple issues are George Perez and then the last couple are Ron Lim. And if Ron Lim had not been brought in, the book would never be finished. However, you know, Ron Lim's cool, but he's not fucking George Perez, you know, Perez is like, on the the mountain the, the 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 you know he he's Roosevelt Lincoln Washington you know he's up there he's up there on Rush Mount Rushmore of comics um no shade to our boy Ron Lim but he's he's a guy yeah Ron Lim had to be like ah I'll do it myself <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah I don't know I there's so much to talk about with this thing but I kind of don't even know where to go because I'm just like I'm just it's more I think the real thing to discuss is just like the sadness around it for me of like, I can't believe that something this good never got made. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of similar to, it's kind of similar to the, obviously the Shane Carruth stuff, except for, you know, with the Shane Carruth stuff, it was like, oh man, it's so, it's such a tragedy that this didn't get made. I wish this existed. I wish these movies were real and we weren't just like reading these screenplays and just want, wondering what could have been. But also it's not that sad because he he's like a psychopath and like things have happened since that episode was even done. Like at the time that you guys did the Shane Ruth episode, like he had just like gotten into run-ins and he was like going to court and all this stuff. And since that episode aired, he, he like, what, there was, what happened? What, what's happened since then? Like he, he like, some, he, he did something else. He, he like, he was arrested. Oh yeah. He like went to another girlfriend's house again and like accosted her or something. Right. He was arrested in January. So, you know, the Shane Ruth episodes, what they came out, what, like October, November. Yeah. Something like that. December or something like that. Um, or maybe earlier than that. Yeah, in January he was arrested for on for domestic violence allegations against a different girlfriend. So, but anyway, the, so shit has even gone crazier since then, since we since that episode came out. But uh, you know, so it's all so that's like almost like oh, it's not that sad because like yeah, he was kind of like chewed up and spit out by the industry, and but like also like he did these things. He's clearly just like has some issues that he just hasn't addressed, and they're negatively affecting other people. So. Maybe it's not the worst thing in the world that his career didn't like continue on an upward trajectory. Or maybe if he did, maybe he wouldn't have done those things. I don't know. I, I'm not a fucking I'm not fucking Alan Moore where I can unpack the mysteries of the universe. Uh, but but for this, it's like even sadder because it's like it's like that same vibe, but also just this monumental sense of like he was only punished because he just like stuck to his guns on certain things that like maybe I wouldn't have stuck to my guns on. Maybe I would have just been like, I don't fucking put a rating on it. I don't give a shit. Uh, but just for the sin of being like, no, I I don't like that. We were deprived of this. Yeah, I the the other thing that's kind of interesting to me is how like the echoes of this book have manifested in other areas because like this this pitch is pretty iconic. People, you know, it's been passed around in fan circles for years, and there's there's a big following for this pitch. And, um, you know, if anybody's ever read the Mark Wade, Alex Ross book, Kingdom Come, I'm not going to say that it's a one to one, but, you know, it's low key. Like, we're going to do Twilight of the Superheroes, but just file off a little bit of the Alan Moore darkness. And there's still some darkness in there, but, you know, we're going to change John Constantine from being John Constantine to being a, a you know, a, a preacher. We're going to kind of get rid of the central idea that Captain Marvel doesn't age. But fundamentally, it's a a coda on the DC universe about the struggle of maintaining heroism against a bleak future and about one last time that the DC heroes come, come out of retirement to fight the good fight. And, uh, you know, it serves as the end to everything. 
Um, it's also a very good book, but I don't think you get Kingdom Come without Twilight of the Superheroes, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, I, 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 I simultaneously have a lot to say about it and also not much to say about it because I, because it's just like, yeah, that was fucking amazing. That's all, that's all I can really say. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, and I love hearing him break down the business stuff. Like, I know we skipped over some of that stuff because it was just like an hour of reading <laughs> him t- talking about comics, business insider stuff. But like, that's the shit that I live for. And I love that he's like right on the ball, you know, like in 87 predicting what the major downfalls of everything are going to be. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of times where you read those kind of pieces from people and I just don't agree with like most of what they're saying. But this one, I was like, oh, man, Alan Moore doing it up. He's he's here. He's got the he's got it all all written down. Hell, yeah. Well, it's, in- it's interesting because reading that reading like the the pitch parts of it, it felt slightly familiar to me. And it kind of reminded me of the fact that like You know, people think that there's like a there's sort of like a duality to creatives. There's like sort of like the 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 passionate creative who just cares about the art and doesn't care about the business side of things and wants to reject commerciality and they just want to make stuff and they don't care about like being commercial or playing into that bigger game. And then there's like the company men, the people who do it for money and they're all about they're more like marketers than they are creatives and they talk all the talk of the business side of things and they're the ones that you know get more opportunities because because they're pitching based on like oh you can merchandise this and all this stuff um and then and then you know you see you see movies get made or or whatever that are really interesting odd ideas big big movies that get made that are really interesting odd ideas filmmakers that you wouldn't expect to be given these huge opportunities that are given the opportunities and I think the reason for that is because I, I think contrary to what people believe, because I've read like pitch docs like that, like not like that, not that level of insanity, but like the, some of the language used and the way that he approaches talking about how the merchandising ties in and all that stuff. I've read stuff like that from people. I've written things like that uh, to people. And I think that the thing that people don't realize is that the people who don't give a shit about the commercial stuff, the 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 merchandising tie ins and how it like appeals to a mass audience and all this shit, they're actually the best at like pitching that kind of stuff because they're just like, I just want please just make my fucking thing. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to learn how to say what you like to hear. And I'm going to like even more methodically lay this out to you than some dumbass guy who just wants to like get a paycheck would because I really want this thing to get made. Whereas that person like they pitch this and then you say no and then they just pitch to somebody else and it's a never ending cycle for them and they don't really care if they get one thing or the other or whatever but i really want this thing made so i'm going to like monastically devote myself to figuring out how to get you to say yes so they those type of people i think tend to be better at lighting up all those buttons of like the merchandising and it can be on a role-playing game and, and you get that since reading this where you're just like Huh, I didn't I didn't think that Alan Moore would be that savvy with like the business merchandising side. And it's like, no, he absolutely is, because that's the only way that you can get your shit made. And if you really want this thing made, like somebody saying no to this is like a devastating thing to him because he spent so much time developing it. So he has to make sure that like I was like we were joking about before, like you can't legally say no to this. Like you have to make a foolproof way that people are probably going to say yes. I mean, look, man, he he definitely made a foolproof way. To, you can't say no to it. Unfortunately, he said no to it. <laughs> yeah, in, the, in the end, he was the one who said no to it. Yeah, in the end, he was like, yeah, nah, bye. Which good for him for sticking to his guns. Um, I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. If you'd like to find my comics, you can do so at heydavebaker.com or on the internet or... uh in comic book stores or bookstores. Spandrew, where can people find you? You can find me walking down a dark, lonely street at night in the rain. But the thing about this is that if you really think about it, if we're talking about me walking in the rain, there's a lot of opportunities there. You know, we can create an action figure of me. You can create like the the water variant where it's like me, but I have like rain droplets on me. 
Um, there's an opportunity for a video game, a walking simulator. Those are very popular now. Uh, we can do a walking simulator of me walking in the rain. Um, and the thing about that is I think the reason why people are interested in the idea of people walking in the rain is because, you know, an underlying fact of our current society is that we all feel like we're walking in the rain. We all feel like we're alone and out in the elements and we have no protection from the chaos that surrounds us. And yet the rain is the one thing that serves to, you know, cool us down, to clean us, to to satiate our thirst, uh, dot, 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 five hours later. And you can't find me on social media because I don't use social media. But if you want to pay your respects to the dear beloved Poppy, Papa Pricey, you can get his book, D.A. Price. You can get his book, Deadbolt, AI Private Eye, by going to dapricerights.com. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, search Deep Cuts Podcast. You can go to our f- Facebook group, the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group, where we talk about the show and make memes. You can join our bit.ly. Or bit, you can join. I, I'm all fucking mixed up with this today. Uh, you can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Deep Cuts Discord. We talk about the show, make memes, talk about other stuff, play games, so on and so forth. You can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our website, deepcutspod.com, click on the shop, get shirts and hats and all that kind of stuff. You can also get our Mystery Treehouse Junior Sleuth shoulder patch, and you can get our uh, the 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 Mystery Treehouse role playing game coming soon. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.